The part in the Course in Miracles where Jesus addresses what he calls true empathy and false empathy. Mm -hmm. And a lot of what you would say human beings, helping professionals, people that want to be kind and offer help, will feel like they're drawn down into the perspective or into the conditions. You know, they kind of go down and they try to join. You know, Jesus calls that false empathy. And true empathy is really staying with what is real and true. It's very much what you were just sharing about the Buddha and the infinite Buddha nature. You know, that everyone is the infinite Buddha nature of mind. And, and if they don't know it, then it's practice. And you might say that of Course in Miracles is the same thing. It's mind training practice to forgive or to release these erroneous thoughts and concepts and beliefs. So, if we talk about suffering, for example, whether it's physical suffering or emotional suffering, there's a line in the workbook that said, if God is real, there is no pain. If pain is real, there is no God. Uh, it's quite direct. And to we're called into a state of mind where we learn true empathy. We learn to stay in alignment with our source, in alignment with, with God. Christ, whatever we want to call it, Buddha nature, or whatever, and and then we don't have any sense of, of trying to please anybody, of, of, of worries, concerns, all those things disappear in this experience of our oneness, of, of our unification. And so, oh, it's taken a lot of practice for me of uh, going to funerals, you know, it's like we have a little funeral thing of how, how you behave at a funeral, you know, or what would be appropriate. Um, I went to the funeral of my grandmother and uh, she was always so close to me, she would tell me for many decades that she didn't believe in death. So when it came to the day of her funeral, she, I just simply opened my mind and let her speak through me at her own funeral. It's, it's even better than leaving a DVD behind addressing oh, everybody was live. <laughs> and people felt it. They just started crying, they felt all the love. She was in such a state of celebration in her life. She was a witness to me of this unconditional love in my life. And then when it came time for her to her own funeral service, uh, even the woman, the minister that, that gave the, uh, the, the epitaph that, that was supposed to do the service, she said, oh my gosh, David, I wish I had a notebook or a recorder to record all the things that were spoken Day, which is so spectacular, and even at the at the, the cemetery, you know, she was coming through again, saying, "Don't leave these flowers here. Take them with you." You know, encouraging people to to remember her love and take the flowers with them instead of leaving them, you know, on the gravestone. It was just wonderful. But um, it takes a lot of practice in the sense that that we don't want to try to push down any emotions, anything that we're feeling. If you feel concern, or you feel a heavy heart, or whatever, then that's, just, that's your starting point in the healing process, you could say, of, of get going within and getting in touch, and allowing yourself to feel those feelings, allowing them to come up into awareness. And then also, really practice at handing them over and, and releasing those, those thoughts and those emotions. So I just practice with course lessons, you know, I'm never upset for the reason I think. I'm upset because I see something that's not there. I see only the past. You know, my mind is preoccupied with past thoughts. These are core teachings about how we're, we're never upset by what seems to be happening in the world. It's just holding on to these erroneous thoughts and these erroneous beliefs. We're upsetting ourselves. Uh, or we, we could say we're giving ourselves the illusion of being upset really what it is. But um, it just takes takes practice and I think that's one of the reasons why I'm so grateful that, that I had a practice of prayer and meditation that I was guided to really go out, so to speak, and, and practice in countless situations of, of being in that peace, of sustaining that peace, of, of having so many, I call it miracles that came through to show that I was always abundantly provided for every single circumstance over and over and over and over until it finally just became like a, like a natural 
state of mind, a natural state of being. There wasn't uh, anything that was conflicting in my mind anymore. And so, it's, you know, as I travel around, I mean, even as I went to the Course in Miracles conference, um, the, the sermon that was given at the overall conference was kind of, uh, kind of doubtful of this idea of, of enlightenment or bliss, you know, as if it was unrealistic or unreachable. But to me, it's the most natural state that one could ever have. It's not something that's far and out of reach at all. It just feels like the most natural expression. But our groups we have at the Peace House and as we travel around are are really filled with, on a daily basis, people bringing up what they're bothered by. It, even if it's a little bit of irritation and annoyance, uh, we encourage people, well, if that's blocking you from your peace, then that's bring it up, you know. You can bring it up and work through it. If it seems to be major or minor, it doesn't really matter. If it's, if it's not peaceful, then it's an opportunity for release. And so, that's why it's I had to go into it very, very carefully. That's why a lot of it got recorded and a lot of it's turned into like a spiritual path now. So we have Buddha and Jesus, you know, we have different pathways of, of those that have had an experience. And then what seems to follow it is like a lot of practice opportunities. Uh, not for the, the one that's in the presence of it, because it seems like the most natural thing, but, but for the unnatural experience of not being in that presence. You know, that's where the, the practice comes in, that's where the process is, that's where the, the time uh, is, can be used in a very <coughs> thoughtful way. signpost, you know, uh, then I think that's a very safe uh, and, and sound way of going at it. I mean, I, I just met a woman, uh, Cecilia, a partner of Christian, and she said, oh, when she first was presented with the course, she had all these doubts and suspicions and so forth. And, and I said, well, it's like part of the human nature to come up with doubts and suspicions and whatever, but it's like when you take a close look at them, and you start to really say, well, am I feeling the peace? And if I'm not, is there something I can be shown, something that can be revealed to me, that, uh, an insight that can help me pop through and have that experience, then that's a miracle. I mean, that's really a beautiful, you can pop through to that. But, but it's, of course, in miracles, plural, in the sense that uh, the Spirit knows that human being needs a lot of convincing. That's why the practice aspect is in that. And it can be an instant. People ask me, is enlightenment a process or an instant? And I said, it's a process until it's an instant. But really it's an instant. <laughs> but, it, but it seems as you're going through the training, it does seem like a process. And, and you have to treat it that way. It doesn't, it's not like, uh, you know, clicking your heels together and saying there's no place like home or clicking your nose or you know, even when they talk about the darshan, or you know, or getting the diksha, or, or some kind of shortcut, uh, or this and this, it still comes down to the readiness and willingness in the mind. You have to be ready, willing. Like you were saying, happiness is a decision. It's a choice. And if you have unconscious beliefs that are still unquestioned, and you seem to decide for dis-ease, or to be unhappy, or worried, or concerned, then that's just another opportunity to question or release those unconscious beliefs. It doesn't change reality. I mean, reality is happy. And, and it's just like we approach reality by, by going inward. <laughs> 